Thanks for coming to uh, our common reading event. Um, three linguists from our master's program will be talking to you about code switching and linguistic discrimination uh, in Between the World and Me. Uh, we have Katie Connor, who is a second year master's linguistic student here in our uh, English department. Her professional research interests include sexuality, gender, language, popular media, and social media, but personally she also has an interest in critical language pedagogy, uh, linguistic discrimination, and linguistic equality in education. Hannah Smith is also a graduate student uh, in sociolinguistics, where she researches intersections between racializing discourses and politics. She's currently an intern for an editor in New York. And Cecilia Tomasati is a second year MA student from Northern Italy uh, here as a Fulbright Fellow. Her research interests include language contact, identity construction in immigrant communities, and ESL. She previously studied translation and interpreting, and she is always eager to learn more about different cultures, languages, and universities. So, without further ado, welcome. So, hi everyone. Thanks for being here. Today we'll be talking about our common reading and just a brief outline of what we want to talk with you today. First, we'll open with a general discussion uh, and then we'll move on. I'll be talking about language and identity at the beginning to set the general picture of what we want to do with the book on that. And then we'll move on. Hannah will be talking about code switching. And then Katie will take over and talk about linguistic discrimination and subordination. Then we'll have We'll wrap it up with a final discussion and conclusion, and we'll have question and answers. Refreshments and drinks are in the back, so feel free to get some of those, and we can start. Okay, so I don't know if you guys found this video online. It's a conversation between the editor-in-chief from The Atlantic, the magazine, and the author of the book. So we selected just a little piece, and we'll start our discussion based on this little excerpt. <laughs> um, so, have you seen different reactions from black readers and white readers of the book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how would you describe, you know, in broad terms? What well, uh, if, I had to, if I had to break this up, I would say, among white readers, there, there are two camps. Um, there's a, you know, a, a camp that says this guy, you know, hates white people, um, and this is, a, you know, basically a, a work of racism. Um, the second camp is, is this guy is the one. <laughs> I'm like, this is the guy. This is the guy. Read between the world and then you'll know what you need to know about black people. That, that's this is it. This is it. Read this book and you'll you got it. It's over. <laughs> And then, you know, I'm all, you know, they're, they're very learned and, 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 and intelligent and wise and deeply intellectually curious white people who read the book and either like the book or dislike the book, you know? Um, among black people, it's the same thing. You're very, very learned, you know, wise, intelligent, well-read, you know, deeply curious black people who either like the book or dislike the book. Um, and then you have, and I think this is actually the most interesting portion, then you have black people who like the book, but don't understand what the big deal is. And I mean that sincerely, I'm not being critical, like, like, who just feel like, well listen, what he's saying is like, what we know. Right. There's actually nothing being revealed here. Why is the world going crazy over this? Why is this, you know, worthy of, of, of a MacArthur? Why is this worthy of New York Times? Why is this nominated for the National Book Award? Not a new hit. What's going on? You know, and I, and I think what that has to do with is, um, the very limited space uh, within which you know uh, uh, black black writers exist, because I, I think the feeling is um, there will be a number of, of books published by black authors. There will be you know many more books that will you know the, the idea will come about that won't be published. Um, a certain amount get through, um, and you know hopefully when they're of a certain quality, they they, they get hailed by an audience that, that is outside of the African American community, and I think that causes some amount of angst. You know, at least among some group of black folks. 
you know, um, it's a problem. I mean, it's an actual, actual thing. Okay, so he's definitely referring to a lot of important points that we can definitely talk about. But I want you to think first uh, in the terms of if this has been chosen as a common reading for this year, why do you think it's relevant to read this book at this moment in time, and why was it relevant maybe for you guys right now to read this book? Any thoughts on that? It can be you thinking out loud. Yes, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, I think in light of like recent political events and political movements and things like Black Lives Matter, that it's really important for students at NC State as they're coming in and like they're required to be just for them to understand different perspectives and things like that, things that they might not have thought about before coming here, things that they might have dismissed. Um, and I think being a predominantly white institution, it's really important for us to take things like this for our students to read. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I agree. I, uh, even though I am black, I grew up like, I was very fortunate to grow up in like suburbs and stuff like that, so I never really encountered that many things like this, and I think it's important for people like me and I guess other people who never really see it to know that it does exist. Because mm -hmm. I have a lot of white friends who like, like, oh wait, racism isn't a thing anymore, that isn't like still around, and like, mm -hmm. it's because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, and what I like here is that he's giving a lot of different kinds of readings that people can have of the very same book that we're dealing with today. So it, it, it doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily have to be just one kind of interpretation of what this author is doing with this topic, right? So that's why we're talking about this today. And of course, we'll be giving you guys uh, a reading that has to do with language, with discrimination, and language and identity, because this is our area of expertise. So this is where we're heading. So I want to focus on the last quote to start our discussion on language and identity. So he says, page 115, I've spent much of my studies searching for the right questions by which I might fully understand the breach between the world and me. So it's the most salient contrast is between the world constructed or the way it is and him as a person has a son, a father, and a political person in a way because he's a writer, he's a journalist. So we are talking about this in language and identity also because the, the person in charge of the choice of the common readings at NC State brought that up as one of the main reasons to read this book today. And he said that the author's intimate working out of his own identity within the larger and often invisible forces and frameworks of American culture and history will hopefully inspire students who are themselves at a point in their lives of questioning and crafting their own sense of who they are. So now we can definitely move on on the language and identity part of our presentation. And the main point uh, is that Identities are not something that we have just because we exist, but it's something that we construct and it never happens in a vacuum. But it happens in social interactions that we have with people in different contexts. It could be among other classmates. It could be in situations of power inequalities, and that could be even between a professor and a student. It could be on campus, it could be in another reality out there in the world. But that means that we are, um, can you pull up the quote? Yes. So, identity is something that lies dormant and it's ready to be switched on in the presence of other people. I can be Italian when I speak on the phone, but then I can be, I can try to be as American as possible when I'm giving this presentation. So, we can have multiple identities at once and use and enact one or the other according to what we want to accomplish. So that's why being able to talk 
like a pirate or a CEO doesn't mean that we are one, but we might be acting out that specific identity we want for ourselves. So what is important is that it's not just me as in the world and me, but there's also the world. And the world has to accept or not accept the identity you're trying to bring forward. In that way, we can say that the general society is accepting what we want to be in that specific society. But they might say, no, that is not available for you. So what do we do? How much are we allowed to play out our identities versus how much the society is limiting our identity construction practices, right? So this is what it's all about in technical terms. Now, this happens in a lot of situations in the book, if you think about it. When he's at Howard University, he can finally and safely use his identity and feel that the group membership is that of his classmates who are the same way he is and they feel part of a group. And also identity in the book plays out so much when it defines the other. So he's always construct, um, constructing his identity versus something or someone he's not. And in this case, and I saw that what divided me from the world was not anything intrinsic to us, but the actual injury done by people intent on naming us, intent on believing that what they have named us matters more than anything we could ever actually do. So the power of naming someone else's identity and say, you are not part of our group. And usually this is a phenomenon that happens when there's the power inequality. So if, if I'm high in power, I can name someone else as something different. And that will have a lot of power and that will stick to them. If I am down in power, it will be harder for me to bring up what I want to be in a society where I'm low in power. And now this uh, clearly translates to what we call code switching. And Hannah will be talking about this more in detail. Yes, code switching. So we're going to switch gears a little. Um, and this was a great excerpt, I thought, from the book on page 120 that really explain code switching in the best way possible. He talks about it throughout the novel in different instances where he's recalling his past as being someone who is black who lives in America. Um, but the part I want to focus on in this quote is the last part where he recalls a story about going to an airport and when he is trying to get his luggage off the conveyor belt, he bumps into a young black man and he says, my bad. And then without even looking up, the other guy says, you straight. And um, Coates Call, recalls this memory, and in that memory he says there was an exchange that was a private rapport that can only exist between these two particular strangers of this tribe that he calls black. And so now I'm going to show you a clip from Key and Peele, and it's very short, but I want you to really pay attention to what's happening in the clip with their language. Because you're my wife, and you love the theater, and uh, it's your birthday. <laughs> Great. Un un unfortunately, the, um, the orchestra is already filled up, but they do have seats that are still left in the dress circle. So if you want to, uh, me to get the theater tickets right now, we'll do it right now. Go on, about five minutes of work. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. No, they're all good singers. they all good singers. Yeah, son. Mm -hmm. Nah, man, I'm about to, I'm telling you, man, I'm about to cross the street. Nah, they got that one dude in it that you love, man. He gonna be in it, yeah. Come on, man, you know I'm almost there, all right? Right, no, I'm gonna pick your ass up at 6.30 cool. then. Cool. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. The parking is, uh, the parking's free. So they got that Oh, my lot. God, Christian, I almost probably just got mugged right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the main thing that you noticed in that video? When revolving around the topic of language. Well, when they were around somebody that they looked like, they tried to, or they saw somebody, and they figured that if they spoke a certain way, that that would make them fit in with that person. Exactly. That's exactly what was happening. Perfect answer. And I'm going to click to the 
next slide, which is what is code switching? So linguists use this term to um, refer to some an individual who alternates between two or more languages or dialects in conversation or in a sentence. Um, and so people code switch, there are a lot of different reasons why people code switch, but one of the main reasons is being uh, is to minimize negative consequences or maximize positive outcomes. So an example of this would be you wouldn't speak to your grandmother the same way that you would speak with your friends. So you're going to adapt around different settings, different people, and you're going to use, you might use code switching in those situations. So some of the benefits of code switching, a lot of people um, think that code switching is like this random mix of language, but it's actually not. It's actually a structured thing that serves a purpose. A lot of bilinguals use code switching um, to accomplish different interactional goals that they have with other people. And in certain speech communities, there's actually um, an underlying sociolinguistic set of principles that that community has when you are code switching. And that's going to like set the um, the community ranks or how you would use your code switching in different situations in those speech communities based on those principles that were set by the community. So in those instances, code switching actually allows speakers to be more expressive, um, have more individuality when um, they are speaking, and also can sometimes be seen as more a, a more evolved linguistic form. So with code switching, there's also bidialectalism, and this is similar to bilingualism, but um, bidialectalism actually refers to being fluent in two different dialects um, of the same language. So in English, in the English-speaking world, there are a ton of dialects, and it can be linked to either race and ethnicity, or it can also be linked to region. And some examples of American English dialects include African American English, um, Appalachian English, Northern American English, there are a ton. So what this actually looks like, this is a clip of Barack Obama, as the YouTube video says, real cool, but he's actually at Ben's Chili Bowl, bar? What the bowl? bowl. Ben's Chili Bowl, and he's getting food, interacting with people. And I'm only going to play like a few seconds of this, but... <laughs> Beyond the classroom, 
code switching actually is utilized very frequently in media and popular culture. So it's among individuals to reflect individuality in online forums. Um, it can be used by musicians in order to reach a larger audience while maintaining solidarity with their home culture. Um, it's used within newspapers to embed local meaning in a global medium and to convey desired messages and advertisements while already accessible to the target population. So when Coates in this novel talks about code switching or references code switching in stories like the airport scene, um, it's going beyond what we're being taught and it shows like a more accessible form of culture and language. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Alright, so um, we've talked a little bit about language and identity and now we've got this kind of picture of what code switching looks like. Um, another really salient aspect of um, this work by Coates is um, discrimination specifically and talking about um, his moving through the world as a black man, talking to his son directly and talking about like these are the things you are going to face as a black man, um, and kind of talking very uh, specifically about history and stuff. Um, linguistic discrimination is something that we don't necessarily often interact with um, explicitly. It's something a lot of people, I would probably say the vast majority of people, um, y'all can talk to me all that if you want, but I would argue at least in some form, most people will come into contact with some form of linguistic discrimination in their life. Um, this is a quote by Rosina Lippy Green, who does work on language and discrimination very specifically. Um, you know, so discrimination specifically based on language variation is really commonly accepted. We have built it into culture to be acceptable to say, you use this word or talk this way or have this accent or dialect, so I'm going to discriminate against you actively and people think it's funny, there are memes about it. You know, like, I don't discriminate based on, like, race or creed, just on whether or not you have, right, like, correct grammar. So, like, this is a thing that exists, and we still accept it as a society as a whole. Um, it's called, like, the back door to discrimination, and that door stands wide open, and that includes at institutions like NCSU. Um, a couple of quotes that I found, um, specifically kind of looking back and thinking about in the book specifically discrimination, but um, I think that probably the most salient one um, is the top one. So there are no racists in America, or at least none that the people who need to be white know personally. Um, again, going back to this idea of being able to say like, oh, I'm not racist. If people would just speak correctly, we wouldn't have a problem. And it kind of builds on this idea that there is a correct or a standard way to speak, when in reality, dialects are equal. There is no standard dialect. There is no dialect that is one or better than the other. So it's really important to remember that linguistic discrimination exists out there and continues to be this weirdly acceptable form of way of like holding people down or to like lower status or rating people's um, specific like intelligence or things like that or their worthiness of help. Um, one way we can talk about language and dialect um, Discrimination is something called linguistic uh, subordination, and again, this is from Lucina Lippy Green. It's in her book English with an Accent. It's really great. I highly encourage you to go look at it. Um, these are the eight ways that she talks about the process of linguistic subordination happening. So these are the ways that people specifically work against people who specific, uh, speak a specific language or dialect. Um, so you can see that first one. So language is mystified. So it's nice idea. This idea of like, oh, like why are you speaking this other language or dialect? Like. That doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, you're never going to understand this or the way the world works if you continue doing that. Um, the second one, authority is claimed. So, for example, this would be like me saying, like, oh, well, I speak standard English. And so clearly, if like I speak standard English and I'm a graduate student, you all should listen to me and speak like me. So it's like me trying to like claim this authority and like point to a specific way that you should be speaking because of that. Um, misinformation, so saying things like, oh, like, you can't say y'all or you can't use habitual be because that's incorrect or that's going to make you look down, you know, people are going to look down at you or things like that, you know, saying that sort of thing. So creating this, like, kind of, like, network of not quite half-truths to kind of make people question whether or not their language or dialect is correct. Um, targeted languages or dialects are trivialized. So this is when somebody's like, oh, that's really cute, or, like, you sound so homey, like, things like that, where they, you know, generally use that tone of voice where you're like, you know, was that a compliment or was that not? You know, it's hard to tell sometimes. Um, conformers are held up as positive examples. So again, this would be me saying like, oh, look at Cecilia. She speaks such good English. Like, you should speak English like Cecilia. She's great. Like, you know, pointing to specific people who are doing the thing you want them to be doing or speaking that way and trying to make them look like golden children, although we do love Cecilia. Um, and then saying non, or looking at non-conformers and pointing to them as um, marginalized people are saying like, you, you don't want to speak like them, like, 
they don't sound right or they don't sound smart or you know, look how like dumb they look, like don't speak like that. So again, pointing at them as bad examples. Um, explicit promises are made. So if you speak, you know, for example, kind of coming back to this controversy about the language of power, but if you speak the language of power, you will get employed. If you speak the language of power, you will have access to this. So specifically pointing to it saying, if you do X, you will get Y in promising that. And then on the flip side, we have this final one, threats are made. So saying like, hey, if you talk like that, like you know you're gonna get a beat up. Or if you talk like that, people are gonna judge you, you realize that, right? So specifically saying like, if you continue to speak in this specific way, these things are going to happen. So all of these scenes happen in a number of orders and in a number of ways. Um, but again, these are all things that we hear on a daily basis and in a lot of ways we've been taught to accept. Like, yeah, if you use ain't, of course you're not gonna get a job because like that makes you sound uneducated. And we don't want uneducated people working for us. Like, but we're taught these things despite the fact that, again, as we linguists know, no one dialect or language is better than another. They are all inherently equal. We've just been taught very specifically that certain ones aren't okay based on the people who speak them or where they are spoken. So why does recognizing language and dialect as vital to race and ethnicity and identity matter? Um, the book grapples with this a little bit, not necessarily directly, but does grapple with this along the lines, again, of also accepting identity and talking about some of these things historically. Um, going back to two of the quotes that were previously featured, again, looking at the fact that by validating our own language and dialects as individuals, we are able to validate our identity and move through the world as equals. We are able to move through the world in the ways that we wish to move through the world. And that's really important to be able to uphold that for other people. Um, going back to the Howard University example, you know, if we think back to the subordination, you know, people are doing that on NC State's campus, and again, I would make an argument that those things do happen on campus. I watch them happen on campus. Are we really making this a space for people to be able to represent themselves, represent the places they come from, represent who they believe they are on campus if we're making them hide certain parts of themselves or change certain parts of themselves in order to be acceptable members of campus? So it's really important to remember that some of these things are like really tied to who people are. Um, in, you can't just necessarily demand that people stop doing or acting in ways that they are based on their language or based on their dialect in order to be acceptable members of society. So with those heavy questions in mind, um, this is kind of like the end of like the formal talk. Um, what we're kind of hoping for or thinking of next, um, thinking about or kind of thinking out loud about other moments in the book that deal with language and race and discrimination that maybe you all want to talk about or unpack. Um, are there any experiences with language in the book or in your own life that you see reflected in some of these concepts we've talked about? Um, are there other questions about language or dialect or any of the concepts we've talked about that y'all have for us? Um, other questions, other comments? Again, this is the end of the formal talk, so we're just kind of looking to have like a guided discussion and question and answer session for anything y'all might be interested in. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, personally for me, um, I have an experience that's kind of like, I guess like the opposite of what would like typically happen mm -hmm. because I grew up mostly in suburbs, but then I went to an all black, well mostly black high school, mm -hmm. and um, like oftentimes people would be like, "Why do you speak so white?" Or like mm -hmm. they would like, I don't know, like I just get judged a lot and looked at weird a lot. Like I didn't fit into my own culture because yeah. I don't speak like a lot of other African Americans. So it's like a weird thing. Well, it's really interesting, especially because they're actually like. There are really interesting misconceptions about the ways, again, people are expected to speak based on the way that they look. And, like, again, like, you'll get any of us, we'll, like, harp about it all day long. But, like, we're all, like, if you speak the way you speak, like, speak the way you speak, and that's beautiful and wonderful. But, yeah, it's, like, especially hard when, like, there are cultural expectations about the way you should be speaking as a specific member of a perceived group. And when you don't fulfill those expectations, it's really hard to move past that sometimes for some people. And on that, I also like what you say that sometimes it can be the reverse. And I'll give you an example on a situation of multilingualism instead of multidialectalism in my case. In an Italian community, it's, um, it's important to have a good English accent because that gives you power and it would mean that you are educated enough to be able to speak a foreign language. But if you do that with a perfect English accent, then you would be pretentious. Because that way would be you're not belonging anymore to your original community and you're not speaking still with your Italian identity as part of yourself. So it can be tricky according to where you are and what kind of community you want to fit in, right? 
Yeah. I moved to um, New York for school, and I grew up down here. And I don't, I don't, you know, people don't think I have a southern accent down here. And I went up there, and every time I said anything, people would be like, "Oh, you sound like a southern belle." And then any time I said anything, people would be like, "How sweet!" Like. And it was very frustrating in class because, like, no matter what I was bringing up, people would just be like, adorable. <laughs> Which, yeah, so. Yeah, one of the grad students, it's Stephanie Dunstan in 2013, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. one of the grad students who actually graduated through our program in 2013 did mm -hmm. her master's thesis? Her PhD, but she did the master's of PhD. Her program, too. Damn. Mm -hmm. um, her PhD thesis or dissertation, uh, but actually did work on looking at students in the classroom and found like kind of what you'd expect but like when you judge students dialects in classrooms and do some of those like very overt like oh how sweet or oh that kid sounds dumb like they are much less likely to stay on campus much less likely to feel accepted on campus or participate in class or on campus in general like mm -hmm. it's almost like people like don't want to be disrespected i dropped out so <laughs> yeah, that's cool. awesome. but, yeah just kind of going back to that it kind of makes you feel like um the way you talk is distracting almost. Like, I've had experiences here where even if, like, I don't think I'm code switching, if I, like, kind of get really emotional even, it just, like, seems like I'm getting sassy or something from people, so they kind of, like, change the way they talk to me, so I'm trying to adjust it. And, um, yeah, I just, I, like, don't want to, like, make a scene or just, like, take away from what I'm saying, so I try to speak as standard as possible. Yeah, I, I think um, when you were talking about like the in reference to the language and dialects, I really think like they were both talking about the trivialization aspect is one of the most salient points. And I guess my question was like, I'm thinking about instances like I have a really good friend from Eastern North Carolina, and she has like a lot of strong, you know, like interesting vernacular that you don't hear. And it's like I was gonna say like in your opinions, or I guess opinions of anybody in here, it's like how. Because it's like, from my position, I've realized maybe I have trivialized the things that she said at points, but like, at the same time, I know that I have genuine appreciation. Like, where's the line drawn between like, I guess like, how do you keep from trivializing people's code codifying, and how do you encourage them to not hide it? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like, I feel like, yeah, I was about to say, I feel like it's a respect thing. Like. So for example, like I have friends, I have friends from like Australia and New Zealand who like have like wildly different words for things than I do. And like so sometimes we'll be like, I have no idea, like what was that, like what what's that mean? And they'll be like, oh, that's what we call this, or like that's how we say that. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool, and like move on from it. And like it's like for me at least, like it's a matter of not like doing the focusing in you're like, oh, that's so different and so cool. And like I want to use that word now, or I wish I had this accent. It's like the weird like when you go into like honing on in on the thing is when it crosses <laughs> over from like appreciation and being like, oh, that's neat, you say that differently than I do, into, like, patronizing and, like, yeah. that next level. Well, like, that is patronization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I think it's easier to handle when it's within a group of friends. Yeah. Because you know the other people. And we have this ongoing joke about the way I pronounce the word identity. And I know how to make a flat D and say identity. But right now, I just... I'm comfortable with the way I say it, with my accent, but it's a joke that can stay in the group because I know I love my friends, I love my classmates, that's fine even if it gets trivialized. The problem is, and that's what you were saying, how can we uh, find a way to draw the line maybe with strangers? Because it might be out of curiosity that you start the first time and ask about their accent but the other person might perceive that as a microaggression. Like, why are you pointing out at the way I speak differently? So I think that being able to um, go out in the world with the awareness that people speak, speak in a different way is already the first step to be open to language diversity. Then, of course, people might perceive that in different ways when you ask it. But I think that this should not mean that you should not ask about other dialects. You should do that being aware that that is something that might also happen to you or someone else asking you about your accent because there's no privileged way of speaking. There is one because society tells us which one is in power and which one is not. 
but at the end of the day, they're all equally valid, as we said before. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I was going to add on to that too, because it can be difficult, you know, because it's so, it's so complex, and it's so different for different people, like, Foreigners deal with different things as a uh, rural person does, as a POC does, as a POC as rural does. It, it's it's hard because I think a lot of it is just understanding. Like, people don't understand what people go through a lot of times. So they don't understand, why are you defensive when I'm asking this? And instead of saying, why are you defensive, they get defensive back. But what they don't understand is that every time a person, a person of color that speaks the way that I do, that dresses the way that I do, every time I walk into a room, I have to read the room. I have to know... Okay, okay, this is a perfect example. Class, first day of class. It was always stressful. It's stressful as hell. Because I have to walk in there, I have to know, okay, how can I talk? If I, if I speak a certain way, am I just going to be affirming stereotypes? And is that going to ruin this semester for me? This, you know, there's so much. And now that's just one class, but then you deal with it. Now I'm 25 now. I've been dealing with that. And English wasn't even my first language, so I've been dealing with a whole bunch of like language identity issues. And just over the course of a life, you can see how defensive people would get. But a lot of times it's just misunderstanding because when you come up and you ask that question, all things, oh God, here's another white person I have to explain this to. Or, okay, how are they going to receive this? Are they going to laugh? The problem is a lot of times people laugh, you know, and that makes it hard. When you're trying to explain something and they just think it's funny and you're just like, this is the way that I speak. This is my everyday life. This is not a funny thing because, I don't know, it can, it's, it's a complex issue and that's, I think, what people forget a lot of times. Oh no, it's for them. Yes, please. Yeah. So one of our other professors studies this a lot, and like one of her papers is about the question that a lot of foreigners get, of, like "Where are you from?" Which is like always usually like code for some. They they hear an accent, a foreign accent, and then they want to know like where is this from? And like you were just saying. That question is not necessarily coming from like a negative place, and so, like I'm a linguist, I love language, and so I sometimes when I hear an accent or a dialect, I want to comment and say like, oh, this is really beautiful, or like I notice you have this feature because I'm creepy, <laughs> like oh, I heard that grammar pattern, whatever. I want to comment on it, but I know that like maybe they've already had so many comments or so many questions that even if it comes from like a genuine place of either curiosity or like I think that's beautiful because of their history of always being asked where are you from to be like oh pointing out the fact that you sound different even if I try to frame it in like a positive way it might be perceived as negative so I think like someone Cecilia said just the difference of being like strangers versus having like a little bit of rapport is different because then if I know Cecilia for a while, I already know where she's from and I want to say, I love the way you say identity, it's so beautiful. She will know that it's not like I'm making fun of her. But if you just said, oh, like the way you say identity is hilarious, Jody, ha ha ha. Like, no, that's, that's yeah. not going to yeah, like, go over well. Yeah, that seems like blatant. Yeah. And I guess like you both were saying, or like all of you were saying, it's like it's a very, it's hard to know, like, you know, you, there is no line in the sand that mm -hmm. can be drawn. It's a very subjective situation for like, you were saying like such different backgrounds that are yeah. established. And it can change too, because I can speak with you a certain way, but when I'm around your group of friends, that might not be like Yeah, that. exactly. And yeah. so you might think, oh, why is, why is Dion being like this? Why is he acting all uptight and speaking a certain way? Well, it's yeah. just because that's just, because I, I don't know, yeah. those, you know. Yeah. yeah, that's why context plays a big role in this, in language usage in general. Which way am I going to speak if I'm in that group versus the other? Mm -hmm. And there is a cognitive effect when we hear someone speaking in a different way. Like our brain realizes that there's something different. And the effort that we need to make to understand the other person is somehow voluntary and unconscious, but if there is a judgment, a value judgment, that effort is not going to happen if it's a negative one. So it's not that it's impossible. It's possible to the extent we avoid any value judgment toward the difference. And then any, any different kind of language can be 
language if we have the knowledge, but let's say dialect, can be understood because we are making the effort. Our brain is processing the difference and there is no ideology that is preventing that from happening. Thank you so much, Ren. Yeah, thanks Thank for being you. here. And please help yourself in the back. There's plenty of stuff. Everybody supports us. Oh, yes. Do you guys have other questions?